Heading to the City of London is like going home. Fleet Street, one of its most famous addresses, was always the denizen of journos who were known to enjoy a tipple or two. My guest today welcomes me back with a gimlet that's pure London through and through. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time. Very few businesses are allowed to use the livery of the City of London. And William Burrell, the director of the City of London Distillery and founder of Vestal Vodka, explains how it all happened, plus so much more on today's episode, sponsored by the City of London. Did you know that the City of London is just one square mile and forms the oldest part of London and was founded by Romans more than 2,000 years ago? It even has its own mayor and government and is run independently from London. The city has so many things to see and do, before and after work, from quirky independent cafes to internationally renowned cultural institutions, world-class modern architecture to historic heritage sites. From high-end shopping to vintage stalls, from street food to Michelin star restaurants, and of course, from small boozers to glitzy wine and cocktail bars. There's a little bit of everything for everyone. The City of London is a vibrant part of London with its own unique atmosphere, culture, and history just waiting to be rediscovered. So now, let's discover it with William. Now, my story starts 30 years ago. We have a family farm in northern Poland. Uh, My father was a a war correspondent, but he moved there, and it's probably the most rural place you will ever see in your life, okay? Really the middle of nowhere. So as a child, I was there every summer for about 30 years, and about 11 years ago, I came to the conclusion that why don't we start looking at the way vodka used to be made? So we started regionally looking at these kind of moonshines, and some of them were amazing, like unbelievably amazing. They were sort of like the love child of an eau de vie and tequila. If they went to Cancun and had sex, this is what we were making. So like unfiltered vodka's incredible. And, you know, skipped to 11 years, and our small family farm and distillery partnered up with a company called Halewood, a a really amazing family spirit and wine company in the UK. And that's where we are today. I not only look after Vestal Vodka, but I'm also here at the City of London Distillery in the heart of London, and actually the only distillery in the walls of the City of London. Do you know about the City of London at all? So it's funny that you say that because when I moved to London, I just assumed the city of London was all of London. But then I found out very quickly that no, it wasn't. It was an actual distinct part of London. But tell me more. It operates, you know, it's got its own police force or it's got its own jurisdiction. It's got its own sort of like planning. And I think there are some archaic laws that date back, you know, several centuries I guess in a way it has a little bit of that kind of Vatican vibe, you know, (laughs) like it's a little bit unto itself. But one of the most amazing things about it is their desire to preserve this incredibly old world approach to the City of London. The City of London, when you see it, unfortunately, it's had things like the Great Fire. But again, that's several hundred years ago. But it's gone through these resets. And when you go to the city of London, any tourist who's been here or any Londoner, you know, I would suggest come down and have a little look. It's all of these small little lanes and and buildings and sort of the architecture is a mismatch. You've got everything from St. Paul's Cathedral to these little lanes and old pubs like the Cheshire Cheese, where you can sit where Wordsworth would be there or Samuel Pepys. And it's, and it's dark and it's got lit fires and stuff like that. So it's unbelievably interesting sort of the city of London. We're very lucky to be the only distillery within the city of London because we were given permission to use their livery. So that defines the city of London. And, and that's one of the key points that... I think we maybe got a bit lucky, but I think they came round and they saw us and they were like, you guys are making gin. Kind of the way that they used to make gin, I think it's close to kind of like traditional London dry gin production, as you can probably even imagine. It's got that kind of Hogarth feel to it. 
All right, we need to unpack so much of that. Let's go back to, say, you said you're the only distillery in the city of London right now. There must have been a whole lot more gin distillery throughout the year. So how did you end up being the only one now? So, you know, I think we look at this gin resurgence and what happened is, I think probably we could say maybe about 11 to 15 years ago, the gin market and even like the spirits market was kind of like a little bit like, you know, it was quite bland. When you went to a bar, there was maybe one type of gin, one type of vodka, and then this craft distilling thing opened up. Now, I think what we had was we had that wonderful gin boom where, you know, everyone went crazy. I think it's been well documented on your podcast. Every man, woman and child was drinking litres of gin. They were throwing the baby out with the bath water and stuff like that. There was lots of consumption and home distillation. And, and a lot of that was unregulated. So I'm skipping through history here a little bit, but I'm sure kind of most of your you know, uh, listeners and viewers have gone through this before. We then go for this period where there's not very much variety or innovation. And suddenly people start to prove that you don't have to be a large corporation to deal with the paperwork that goes with the tax and the duty on liquor and spirits. And people figure out that it's actually just paperwork. It's a pain. It's a real pain. But if you can dot the I's and cross the T's and be patient, you can get a license. So a lot of these distilleries start popping up. And the city of London, about 15, 16 years ago, because we're very close to Fleet Street. And, and one of the things people should understand is that Fleet Street used to be this production hub for all of the newspapers in the UK. So the tabloids, the Broadsteep, they were all here. So it sort of had that real kind of sense of production about it. Now, you know, maybe like New York, where you're from, the meat packing district has gone a bit hipster and, you know, they don't pack meat so much anymore. They don't make papers so much anymore here. So Fleet Street was this amazing place in this particular building was actually called the Golf Club. And I imagine when the Don Drapers of this world, like Mad Men, went to their secretary, Doris, I'm just going to the Golf Club. They were going to this bar, and this bar had this reputation with um, all of the journalists and writers and sort of like people of the day who, and I have to say, this only happens in the city of London as far as I can tell. These guys were drinkers. You know, the three, five, like martini lunch kind of vibe. That's what these guys were doing. So, um, hey, sorry about that. We were just grounding out some juniper. Uh, but don't tell anyone because that's our secret. That's how we get uh, maximum flavor. But don't tell anyone. No one's going to know, Susan, right? No one's going to know. So, you know, it's funny. I would have edited that out, but now I'm not going to. Why would you? Okay. I just had to escape. And then, you know. little juniper grinding happening. Oof. Yeah, we did used to do it with the mortar and pestle, but now we do it with the machine. But don't judge us, okay? We still make this stuff, as you can see. We've got Fleet Street, and these people are drinking to excess. You know, sometimes when you inherit a bar, there was a bar before, there was a pub before, or something, you know, you've got the ghosts going around. And the ghosts here are very comfortable drinking martinis and gin and tonic. So we're happy with that. Then Jonathan set up a bar here, and I think ran it again for that purpose of gin and tonics. And then came upon this idea, why am I pouring somebody else's gin? Why don't I put in a, a big still and then I'll make my own gin? So he put in something and City of London was born. It's been through many guises, but the, the defining factor of City of London and the City of London gin, but now predominantly the Whitley Neal Connoisseur's cut. He then put in this uh, still and he created something that is still here today. Although what we are doing is we are building on that. And so we've got the biggest still, Elizabeth, and she's 400 litres. And then after Elizabeth, we've got Clarissa. She's 130 litres, and she's got her sister called Jennifer, and she's like 130 litres. So all of these ladies, very sophisticated ladies, who lunch, let's, let's not beat around the bush, Elizabeth will produce something like about 1,000 bottles She's a 400 litre still. She'll do a thousand bottles a day of gin. Oh, no way. So it's genuinely something, this is not just for the tourists. You know, this is the space where it's a production facility, but then it's also a bar as well. So as we say, you can have a gin and tonic anywhere in the world, but there's not many places where you can have a gin and tonic 
and see it being made. And if you're very lucky, and Susan, I hope you don't tell the government about this, okay? But if you're very lucky and you creep in, you can actually put your finger under the still and just taste it off the still, which if you haven't been on a gin tour, I'm not saying come on ours, go on any gin tour around the world, any spirit tour and taste a spirit fresh off the still and you will see just uh, flavors that are so zesty and effervescent. They're sort of like those kids sweets that sort of fizz on your tongue a little bit and those kind of incredibly sharp flavors coming through. And at 80% ABV or thereabouts, you're not tasting it. Mm. And I've always thought that coming off the still like that, what happens is, is you've got that, like cooking, it's, there's a freshness there. It's amazing. It's amazing. Since we are in London and the city of London was one of your first gins that you created, a London dry gin? A hundred percent London dry, a hundred percent. And what's been crazy is just to sort of see the gin market. Now, you know, look, I'm, Susan, I'm a vodka chick through and through. OK, <laughs> I love my vodka. I always will do. But at the moment, what we've got with um, gin has been this explosion of lots of craft sort of gins and London dries and stuff like that. But then we saw this kind of explosion of flavors within gin. And that's been amazing to see. OK, and they're both incredibly strong categories and people still love those styles of gin. But I'm going to let you in on a tiny little secret. And I'm looking into the future here. OK. And I have to say, you know, my track record's been okay, kind of making these predictions. We recently held something called the Grand Martini Competition, where bartenders from London had to create their own distillate and then make a martini from it. And we had these incredible entries. Now, the person who won was actually a guy called Giuseppe from a place called Nightjar. OK, famous bar called Nightjar. Amazing. Now, Giuseppe was not what I call a star tender. OK, he wasn't one of the big names. He was a junior bartender, but he produced a gin with Parmigiano and Porcini mushrooms that was unbelievably umami in a martini. Now, so much so that we kind of looked at all of these different gins being produced. And again, let's say I love a London dry. I love flavored gin. I'm into all of those. But we took inspiration from that. And I don't think anyone's seen this yet. This is like super new. I just opened the box 30 seconds ago. Spiced gin. Oh. So what you're looking at is you're looking at a gin with all of these incredible botanicals. There's a large amount of sort of cardamom and turmeric, ginger. There's a little bit of chili in there. And what that shows us is that... We pick up on these sort of zeitgeist ideas. If all the bartenders who came down for the Grand Martini competition were predominantly making savory or umami gins, maybe there is a general psyche. Maybe there is something in the air that these things lead from the bartenders. A good example is about three years ago, there's a spirit called Midori. Midori became this kind of thing, you know, Japanese watermelon, Bartenders were going crazy for it. And there were bartenders for the first time who were like, oh, my God, have you seen this new Midori thing? It's like, yeah, I've seen it. I'm on the third cycle of this one. I remember it. And, and then, you know, I started to see these watermelon Negronis or watermelon as a flavor became very popular. So if you do look at the bartenders and what they're doing with flavors at the moment, it can be really interesting because you can take those kind of like little points of reference and then see maybe... And I say maybe because this is like putting money on horses. What is going to be the next big thing? And we see spiced and savory as a really interesting segue to get to keep people interested in the gin market. Because all of these things are very cyclical and they kind of go around and, and they'll become popular again and then drop off. And that's what happens. So, yes, spiced gin. You heard it here. You know, it's so funny because gin originally was if you think back to the 1800s, 1700s, was quite sweet. And the old Tom gin. And now, you know, 300 years later, our palate has become um, used to more savory things yeah. like Amaro. Yeah. And, you know, champagne was always popular with sugar until the English and Americans started to drink it. Yeah. 
they took that out. Yeah. And now I guess we're getting spicier and spicier. So from bitter, we're transitioning to spicy. You know, I think that bitterness is incredible. And I think actually the bitterness is incredible in America because I think they were a later adopter to bitterness than the Europeans mm-hmm. because of obviously the, the inclusion of bitters. But as you say, Amaro's and various products from Campari to Aperol to, you know, they, they have that bitterness, that gentian root going through. And I think that was a newer thing for the US market. But to see them embracing that, you know, it definitely then becomes a bit more of a global palette. And you're right, because, you know, there are very different palettes around the world. Something that works somewhere might not work somewhere else. And just on the point Mm -hmm. with um, the gin, you know, it's amazing. You can buy all of these wonderful old gins from like the 30s, 40s and 50s. And there is a lightness and a sweetness to them. If we go further back to Geneva's, they, they have kind of quite a bready one-dimensional note. So I think those gins originally, I think, would have been fairly one-dimensional. They wouldn't have had a lot of what's going on at the moment. I'm sure the juniper would have been there, but I think it would have been like an overly predominant juniper with a few other bits and bobs. One more thing we have to unpack is the livery thing. So tell me exactly what a livery is and why you are allowed to put it on your bottle. So this is the coat of arms for the City of London distillery. And we were very privileged. It's almost like a royal seal in a way. We are recognized within the City of London as being reputable producers of gin. And they were happy to put their coat of arms, their seal of approval on what we did because for lots of reasons, but I think the quality speaks for itself. When you come down here and you know you see the production, and and, and I have to say, if if I took you back there, it's like a little warren, and and there's an old beer drop where they used to drop barrels of beer down, and that's where we put things up and down, and we've got an electric forklift truck that has to maneuver, like in a space this big, and then there's people sort of like manhandling like hessian sacks made of cloth if we had the black plague i think we would be an official visitors attraction of ye olde england it's kind of incredible what they do back there so for all of those reasons we were allowed to do that and then secondly one of the other things is is the city of london i think recognizes that tourism you know that they want to let people know that this is an area that is not just now full of lawyers, insurance, finance, all of that stuff, you know, there is a a genuine point of interest, you know, and I think our proximity to the Church of St. Brides is just over there. And again, if you if you Google the and just go on Google Maps, you'll see we're on a tiny little lane, you know, that kind of like meanders down. Yes, totally. And it must feel really special to be the only City of London distillery, especially when The city of London is like one of the oldest sections and had the history of gin production there. It lost it. And then you've come back. It must, I don't know, feel fab. Susan, it makes it worthwhile when nice people like you take an interest uh, because we're sort of subterranean. We're sort of, you know, we're like little mole men. We sometimes come out for a bit of light and then we're just making gin and, you know, stuff. So, yeah, it makes it, it's cool. Well, I... I love it. It's a great bar. And I know that you make lots and lots of different cocktails. And so even though I don't usually talk about the cocktail of the week, you gave me so many to choose from. I thought, no, it's a good thing. Well, they sometimes say that a cocktail menu should be very simple, but I don't know. Maybe we just, we went overboard. Three. Okay. I should, I should, usually people just send me one. So you send me three. So tell me a little bit about them and how they came about, who, who created them. Well, and uh, so, so with the Gimlet, are you into kind of fresh lime juice or do you sort of... Go- I love the Gimlet. It's one of my favorite gin cocktails, actually. You know, there's lots of debate about it. I think the Gimlet, weirdly, sort of seems to have this subsection of society. Like there's almost like a, a Gimlet appreciation society. And I feel like, what do they say? The Gimlet is gin's equivalent to a daiquiri. It's sort of got that bartender feel to it, but it sort of almost feels a little bit more sophisticated. And, and, it's, and it's strange. If it's not on the menu, I think it's one of those drinks that if you go into a bar anywhere in the world and say, I'll have a gimlet, they'll look at you and they'll be like, oh, yeah, 
you're either a big boozer or you work in the industry. So why did you did you decide to replace the line with with grapefruit or no, no, no. the line's still in there? Um, I think we're going to put the spec up on your site so we can kind of follow that. But I think the thing was is just to look on a twist, sort of like the grapefruit that we produce. You know, the amount of grapefruit that goes into it is alarming, and I just sort of felt like it was sort of like a a zesty on zesty kind of like vibe, which I really did enjoy. Kind of, and I think when we've served it to people, some of these cocktails that do come from you know those old cocktail books whether you know it's the harry craddock's the savoys the you know those old cocktail books i think arguably you could say they're quite boozy cocktails you know they're mm. if, if i if i have a friend round and i say to them oh hey would you like a you know a gimlet or any kind of, of those cocktails of that era then i'll present it to them and they'll take a sip and their face kind of is like whoa this is boozy like strong and and i think those cocktails did tend to kind of rely a lot you know on a sort of an intense kind of like burst of flavor but also booze and i think the intention of those cocktails now we might have you know kind of gone a little bit off piste here with our consumption but those cocktails you know it was one or two you know you weren't having I don't know, five, six gimlets. Right. You know, you were going to a place very quickly, you know, and it was then sort of, it was a cocktail before dinner. And then at dinner, you'd have wine and everything. But, you know, you weren't going to a place where you were sort of stumbling and falling about and all of those things. So I think, you know, the way that we drink cocktails, certainly we drink older recipes of cocktails, you know, has changed quite a lot. You know, I don't think we kind of appreciate that they were there for sipping and savoring. You know, I think a lot of people kind of go at these kind of cocktails quite, you know, full steam ahead. No, absolutely. Absolutely. You said you were going to talk about your gin. So do you use the connoisseur's cut in that? Well, that was something that we were actually, the connoisseur's cut was something, another thing we had to unpack. So the connoisseur's cut, what's been amazing about the connoisseur's cut is, first of all, it's a London dry gin, but for those gin lovers out there, it's 47% ABV. So already, you know, this is not normal. This is not, this is something to be savoured. It gets made here daily in that larger still over there, Elizabeth. And within the Connoisseur's Cut, you know, it's the overriding kind of like flavours of that London Dry, but with that incredible zestiness with, for me, the kind of like the pink grapefruits coming through, the orange, the licorice, like all of those lovely notes, obviously, your juniper, coriander seed, angelica roots, stuff like that uh, as, a, as a base. But because it's kind of produced in a sort of one shot, and what you see is what you get, you know, sort of it passes through. One shot gin tends to be very uneconomical to make. But if you want to make the best gin in the world and win awards, then what are you going to do? You know, I'm sure if you were running a Formula One team like Ferrari, that's very unprofitable. But you do it because you want to push the pinnacle of your art and your craft. And that's what the Connoisseur's Cut does. The Connoisseur's Cut was born because it was very much something that those kind of bars in uh, predominantly London were, were asking for. And it kind of gave a sense of exclusivity to it. It's a very bespoke product that's sort of made with an incredible amount of care. And in the same way as if a Michelin star restaurant would go and source his meat from the best meat producer, a lot of these top 50 bars, if they want to make a gin that is you know, equal to a Michelin star restaurant and their ingredients, then this is really what they're going to go for. That was really the whole idea behind that. We're actually developing a spirit library. So I don't know, I think, was it Mr. Lion just opened a new bar called the Seed Library, which is a lovely concept. Yeah. You know, and I, and, you know, I remember reading about that in New Scientist sort of about 10 years ago, this idea that we need to keep the seeds. People think that they're more valuable than gold. So we're doing a spirit library. And today we are doing, don't tell anyone, Susan, okay? This is just between us, all right? I've given you far too many new product development ideas, okay? If I see you producing a new gin like this, I will know where this came from. 
we are we are distilling in the road of ab avocado today so we we're, we're interested in avocado it's given us some interesting notes it's a difficult one because avocado is a lot about the kind of the perfect avocado the ripeness the consistency yes. you know in conjunction with eggs or salmon or kind of you know in a salad with feta you know that kind of thing it's sort of got that feel but actually when you kind of put it into a smoothie or you kind of put it into places like that it's got this interesting sort of nuttiness to it it's something we're, we're interested in and a good example of the spirit library is yesterday we did unroasted green coffee beans and it didn't work it was kind of nothing. It was a bit rubbish. So, you know, it's not all success. It's, it's a lot of trial and error. When you make that avocado gin, let me know because my partner is allergic to avocado. Okay. One sip of that. It's funny. My partner's allergic, yeah, my, my, my partner's allergic to ginseng. So it, it's a, so you, do, you do tend to see it quite a lot in cocktails, they, you know. So we have to sort of give a bit of warning. Well, so the, the other two cocktails you gave me were very simple, very classic, the G&T yeah. and the martini. And now we know we have to use the connoisseur's cut for that. So the gin and tonic, I think, you know, this might be a bit controversial, but I'm of the feeling that a decent gin and tonic should be that first sip, like hits you, like really hits you. And I am a believer in a 50-50. So... You know, Ooh. it's as much gin as there is tonic. Mm. Uh, a generous, for me, squeeze of grapefruit. I prefer it fresh grapefruit, so you get that zestiness. I know that there was like a trend for people to have dehydrated fruit on things, on garnishes, which I it kind of gives a candied feel to it. I didn't really feel that I kind of, it wasn't my cup of tea. I think, you know, the fresher you can do things, right? If you've got the technology, the better. Absolutely. And last but not least, the martini. So the martini, I really think the trick for the martini is, I know this sounds a little kind of superstitious, but you need to leave that bottle in the freezer for a good 24 hours. You know, if you do that, then your spirit becomes thick and viscous and syrupy. And it kind of, it's already at that kind of lovely you know, mercurial consistency. And that's where the martini starts for me. Now, look, whether you want to be James Bond, shake it, you know, or you want to stir it and be like a professional, it's up to you. Whether you want to go super fancy on the garnish, bah, 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 you know, or you just sort of like want to just like squeeze a little bit, put it around the rim and then throw it away. It's up to you. You know, I think the, the, the martini is very subjective. And unless you're making them at home, to your spec, I think you just respect what the bar gives you and just, you know, go with it. Because there must be a million connotations of the martini. Of course, you know, you as we usually as we finish, I ask for your top tips for the home bartender. And I think putting the bottle in the freezer for at least 24 hours is kind of a huge tip. Uh, do you have any others? I'm going to go next level, but your your your, okay. your viewers and listeners are going to love me and hate me in equal measures. And I have to say, Susan, most people who meet me, there's a you know there's a love hate thing going on. But if you get your bottle of, you either take some vodka or you take some gin, okay, and you take out about fifty mil or thereabouts of vodka. So that could just be you know, a double measure, little shot, okay? And you replace it with some vermouth and you put that in the freezer. Wow. That becomes your ready-to-pour martini. Now, if you're super organized, and, and this will make the difference, you've now got your martini in a bottle, okay? So ready-to-pour. Get your glassware in the freezer, Get everything super cold. Everything super cold. Well, the last thing I always ask is, if you could be anywhere drinking anything right now, where would that be? And what would it be? I'm, I'm going to be unsurprising. Like millions of other people, I would be at Duke's Bar in Mayfair with Alessandro, watching him be a legend 
a word we use way too much with star tenders, okay? Some people can get propelled to fame very, very quickly. But if you have the time and it's a little bit quiet and you listen to his stories and where he's worked and, you know, his rock and roll attitude, you know, he is not beholden to anyone. He is his own man and he is just day in, day out, Mr. Hospitality. He has a drink that I don't even know because it's, it's, it's shrouded in mystery and it's a secret. It is the truffle martini. And it happened because he made a mistake. He got some truffles from Alba, and he'll tell the story better than me, but he had them in a little cheetah bottle. So, you know, one of those little bottles that you have kind of, you know, for uh, putting yeah. bitters in and stuff like that. So he was there, and he had some in there, but he'd left them in there. But he opened them up and smelt them, and something had happened that they had created something quite beautiful. Umami, savory, zesty, lots of, like, everything going on. All the good components of a great martini. And so to this day, once a year, truffle season, he gets some truffles from Alba, he infuses them for a certain period of time, and then this drink with, I have to say, I'm very proud, uh, some Vestal vodka, goes on the menu, and it is the truffle martini, limited time only. Once it's gone, it's gone for the year. And if you get to try the truffle martini, you have hit the pinnacle of martinis. Just have one drink. I think, you know, Susan, he limits people to two martinis. And that's it. I know, I know that. I understand why, because I had one. I, I've had one, and sure. it was plenty. Yeah. But, uh, yes, they're fabulous. Well, this has been so much fun talking gin, City of London, Thank City you. of London still. A little teeny bit about vodka. Yes. Finally, it was great to have you. So thank you so much for being on the show. You've got to see it at the bar with your name on it. Well, I can't wait. Thank you very much, Susan. Bye. It was great to have William on the program teaching us all about gin and its link to the City of London. The Square Smile campaign is designed to raise awareness of the benefits of returning to the city and face-to-face -face interaction as firms increasingly give their staff more flexibility on where they locate through hybrid working. It showcases the city's vibrant offerings, ranging from world-class culture, heritage, cuisine, entertainment, retail, architecture, bars, and so much more. Visit www.squaresmile.london for great ideas of places to visit, to see, discover, and drink. Which brings us right to our Cocktail of the Week. William went into loads of detail about our Cocktail of the Week, the City of London Distillery's Grapefruit Gimlet. We're already familiar with Whitley Neal Connoisseur's Cut, so grab the bottle and pour 50 mils of it into a mixing glass. Add to that 20 mils of fresh lime juice and 15 mils fresh grapefruit juice. Then add 15 mils simple syrup. Add ice and then stir, stir, stir. Then strain it into a coupe glass and sip. You'll find this recipe, more City of London distillery recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com where you'll find all the ingredients in our shop. I've been a delinquent for two weeks. I escaped to Venice to do research and left everything behind. But I'm back now with so much to tell you. So if you live for Lush Life, make sure you head out to the bars and restaurants you love and tell them how much you love them. The music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always drink responsibly. Next week, you'll meet tons of folks making cocktails in Venice. Until that time, bottoms up. Thank you.